Hello, mate. Hello, mate. You alright? You okay? Yeah, not bad, you? Yeah, I'm good, good. I'm just doing some filming, so you're on my video. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Make sure that's good. Spot in. You heard that. Dan, the editor, is going to keep that in. How's it going, everyone? It's Gavin from Balls TV. And in this video, we're going to be talking about some particular parts of the breeding process, in particular, females. So we're going to be looking at a few more females and looking at how they're developing and looking at the certain projects that I'm excited for in these females that are developing and on their way. But before we get into that, first of all, I want to give a massive shout out to all my supporters, everyone that follows me on Instagram, everyone that subscribes to me on YouTube. I really do appreciate it, guys. And again, I'm not just saying it. It really does mean the world to me, especially when I see you know one new follower or one new subscriber. It just really inspires me to continue and help you guys with this awesome hobby that we, we're very fortunate to do. So I really do appreciate it. So if you are watching this video and you are not subscribed, please feel a bit generous and just give me that subscription. Just hit that subscribe button. And also, if you wouldn't mind giving me a thumbs up if you're enjoying the content, just so I know what's working for you guys, what you're enjoying. And also hit that notification bell because I do get a lot of people sort of not get the notifications. So just make sure, if you can all just make sure that notification bell is ticked and highlighted, that'd be absolutely awesome. If you're not following me on Instagram, then please get over there and give me a follow as well. There's different content that I'll post on Instagram to YouTube. It's not all the same. Uh, and that will give you an indication. All the egg cutting videos will be done on YouTube, so you need to make sure that notification bell's hit. Also, if you're not following me on Morph Market, then please get over onto Morph Market, give me a follow on there as well. Again, you'll get notified when I upload animals for sale. But also, a massive, massive shout out to all my Patreon supporters. You guys are absolutely amazing and I really do appreciate all the effort that you guys do. And also, not only that, with the Discord server that we've got, the Balls to You Discord server, it's absolutely awesome. The topics that you guys discuss and help each other with, it's amazing. It is truly your Discord. It's not Balls to You. It's not Gavin's. It's the people's Discord. And I really do appreciate all the love and support that you all give each other. So, Really give yourselves a, a round of applause and a pat on the back for that. So, let's get into today's video. Today's video is all about your breeding females. And what's important, and I keep saying this, and I've said this for years and I'll keep saying it, you need to learn your animals. You can send me pictures and other breeders pictures of your females and, oh, she's doing this, she's doing that. But, no one knows your animal better than you. We can try and give you some indication on what she's doing or why she's doing it. But ultimately it comes down to you. You know your female, you know the way she's acting. So don't be afraid to sort of try and diagnose why they are doing that or try and find the answers yourself, you know? It's all a learning curve. You know, all the breeders over the world, there is no book, there is no right or wrong way to do this. It's just whatever works for you and you've got to find what works for you. I could tell you how to do it, and my data and my my data is is proof that everything I'm doing for me works. If I can share that with you and it may help with a few things, that's fantastic. My way isn't the only way. I just know it works for me. I'm 92% successful, and that's facts. I've done all the collecting all the data over the years and and sort of doing the percentages, this and the other. I'm averaging about 8.1 eggs per clutch. I'm not doing too bad. Everything seems to be working. Yes, you have your bad results, but predominantly most of the way I do things is on point. Let's talk about females. The females during the breeding season, it's a real, uh, it's one of those things that when you're first starting out, you really sort of, you, you don't know. It's almost like you're going in blind. But what you need to do is not panic and just pay attention. There's females that will be laying more on the cool end, and you think, well, why are they laying more on the cool end? And then there'll be females laying in the water bowl. You may think she's got mites, but she hasn't. There's so many different things that goes on. People mistake builds as ovulations, which you, we've all been there, we've all done that. It can be a very confusing time, especially whether you're uh, you know, a professional 
an intermediate or a beginner, it's a confusing time. Obviously this season I've started using an ultrasound once a month, so every uh, once a month I ultrasound the females to check their follicle development. Now for me, that's not gonna, uh, my, my breeding recipe is successful, okay? So with the ultrasound, it's there now. I've now got another column of data that I'm collecting over the years. So now I can start looking back and start looking at various different data and I can start sort of surmising why and what, you know, why that female's done that and why that female's done that. So you don't need an ultrasound, but what you do need is to pay attention to your females. Fact. A couple of things before we get into and showing you some females. One of these temperature probes is key. It's a temp gun, okay? This is key. I see a lot of people using external um, temperature gauges that they'll put on the racks uh, and they'll run the wire to the back and they'll put it on the heat mat or they'll run it into a tub uh, to try and get some sort of sense so when they walk in the room they can look at that gauge and they can get a fair idea. That, there's nothing wrong in that at all. I used to do it way back in the day. Don't bother anymore because what I've learned is in Africa, where these animals are from, what they're native to, their temperatures will predominantly go up and down. They'll have spikes of high humidity, low humidity. The temperatures will change as well, um, but the snakes will thermoregulate to suit the situation. So what we have to make sure is we have to give them that gradient. We have to give them the cool end and we have to give them the warm end or the, the hot spot. Now you'll hear a lot of people talk about dropping temperatures, all that sort of stuff, which is fine, dropping temperatures, if it works for you, keep doing it, it works. I don't drop my internal temperatures, my room temperature, nor the hotspot, never. The only thing I do is I let the building or I let the house or the room, whatever, wherever the, the snakes are, I let, them, I let that room cool down naturally. The hot spot still remains the same. The hot spot I set around about 88 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit and I let the females tell me. Now the reason why this is important is because every time I see a female doing something, I will go in and I'll shoot the temperature of the female. Okay, so I'll go in, I'll shoot her and I'll see why is she lying there and what temperature she's at? And what I've noticed, and again, over the years, we've, we, you know, we started off at 92 degrees uh, Fahrenheit hotspot, then we've gone down to 90. Now we kind of know maybe 90 is a little bit too high, but one thing is key is airflow. Making sure you've got great airflow in your room, that is key. A lot of people underestimate airflow because they think it's gonna bring on RI. When in actual fact, what it's doing is it's circulating all the air, keeping the temperatures from floor to ceiling more of a regular temperature, more close within tolerance as opposed to the height of the room being warmer and the lower part of the room being cooler. With the fans circulating the area obviously gives it more of an even temperature. The other thing that fans do as well is help with stagnant air. So it moves stagnant air around. And again, in your buildings, whether it be a snake facility, a little room, a shared a bedroom, whatever, having access to fresh air coming into your room is key. And a lot of people, again, overlook that. So if you've got a window, crack the window open a little bit, you know, make sure it's good air for circulation. If you've got a, a shed, maybe an extractor fan or a little vented area, fresh air is key. And the reason why we're talking about fresh air and circulation is because these ball pythons will also work on a barometric, barometric pressure. Yeah, I ain't got my teeth in today, but you know what I'm saying. The air pressure outside, they really do feel the difference. And especially when we, we talk about the rainstorm and thunderstorms coming in, you know, these, these animals do feel it. And I'll guarantee you, if you're having problems with locks, if you put your animals together during a, a storm or a rainy day or a rainy evening, you'll, you'll see a lock. Trust me, they feel it. So if your room is encased and closed in and stuff like that, they're not gonna to get to feel that air pressure. So sometimes, like I said, having that fresh air, letting that window open slightly, having the ventilation in your room really does help these snakes realize where they are in the season, okay? That's why I start pretty much all of my breeding in October because we tend to get loads of rain here in the UK in October. Uh, and that's what, what I'll use for kickstarting my breeding season. The one thing as well, so uh, just to clarify, Get, one, get yourself one of these or a couple of these. And again, 
The one thing I'll notice uh, with a lot of questions is what make, what model, all that sort of stuff. All I can say is most of them are the same. They, they tend to work the same, okay? The difference is the more I drop this, the older it gets, the more out of tolerance it's gonna get. So I would advise every year, buying yourself a new one, putting the old one in the drawer as a backup, just in case, but use that new one because it will have, it will be um, more in tolerance, let's say, provided it's not a real, real cheap, nasty brand, but they have to be calibrated. So the new ones are more calibrated as opposed to your old ones when they get dropped and damaged, etc., etc. So always keep um, a new one uh, or buy a new one on a regular basis. I sort of try and upgrade mine once a year, that sort of thing. But yeah, so that's key as well. So what, we, what we're doing with these is we're not using this as the gospel. Okay, what we're doing is we're using this to gauge an average. Okay, so you'll take three readings and you'll work out the average. Okay, because you'll have different levels of substrate, all that sort of stuff. So when you are shooting temperatures, which I'll show you in a minute, when you are shooting temperatures, you want to make sure that you're getting an average. All right, don't just shoot that and say, look, that hot spot's 90, or that part of the hot spot's 95, and that part of the hot spot's 98. Okay, it's an average. So work on an average basis, use it, shoot it a few times, shoot it on most of the levels, on most of your tubs, and work on an average, okay? Yes, you will have one tub which could be hotter than the other, okay? But again, don't panic, work on an average. That's why they've got a, um, and again, we're talking about the females, that's why they've got a cool end and a hot end, because if it is too hot, they can thermoregulate, okay? So bear that in mind, use this to gain, uh, to gauge your average temperature. So the next thing we're gonna discuss is food. Food is so important, and again, I've stressed it over the years. And in fact, let's rewind, I don't know, five years, only five years ago, maybe even less. Back in the day, if you were selling hatchlings or selling a snake that was a multi-feeder or fed on African soft food rats, it was, it was, known as a problem feeder. It was, oh, it's doomed, hence you'd lower the price to sell it. How wrong people were. So th think about it like this. If you're feeding your animal a regular good diet, it's native food, it's gonna go on to do very well because that genetics of that animal is designed, whether it's captive bred or not, that animal is designed to eat that rodent. It's a bit like putting your dog on vegetables. You know, it's not gonna happen. All the will in the world ain't gonna happen. It's a meat eater, it's, it, it's a carnivorous animal, you know, it, it eats meat. So its main, its body and its digestive system, its teeth, everything is designed for eating meat. You're not gonna start giving an, a, a, a lizard that eats crickets or, or insects or is a, a, an insectivore, you're not gonna start giving it rodents, okay? We've learnt over the years, a staple diet for your animal is key. And this is exactly the same when it comes down to ball pythons. Ball pythons love African soft furred rats because they are designed for them to be eaten by them, okay? So that's fact. So going back 10, five, even three years ago, uh, if your snake was an African soft furred rat, it was classed as a bad eater or a problem snake. When in actual fact, it's not. In actual fact, that's what you do it makes a damn good snake. So I predominantly feed all my collection African soft furred rats. I've seen over the years the difference it makes. And when I talk about difference, I'm talking about condition. And again, we're talking about the females here. We're talking about condition. We're talking about the coloration. We're talking about growth. We're talking about eggs. We're talking about the bounce back factor. And the bounce back factor is after they've laid eggs, they bounce back very quickly, very well. When we're looking at stuff like that, again, you need to make sure that you're giving your animals the correct diet. It will make a massive difference. You haven't got to believe me, but my data again proves that. It's my data that I've collected. Take from that what you will, but my data tells me what I need to know, and I'm not gonna change it, and that's what gives me my success. If you guys wanna carry on feeding you know, rats or mice, that's entirely up to you. It's certainly not a bad thing, but for me, I'd always want to try and, and give you know their, their true diet. 
and cards. I always want to try and make people aware and educate people on their true diet. Nowadays, African soft food rats are more accessible, especially from places like Boss Rat. Order a big bulk of them, you've got them all in stock then. That side of things, like I said, food is key, especially when you're having first time mums who are giving you 11 eggs, okay? Food is key. So when they see that there's enough food, the chances are they're gonna go on and give you a nice, healthy, decent sized clutch, okay? Now I'm not saying every female you feed African soft food rats to, you're gonna have a massive clutch. What I'm saying is you're gonna have a healthy clutch, okay? You're gonna have healthy embryos. Yes, some embryos won't make it, which will die in the egg, and hence why they'll die in the incubation period, but Again, I feed all my snakes African soft food rats. Majority of the snakes that lay for me, I have fantastic clutch clutches from. Again, I think uh, I haven't got the data on the board, but um, I'm averaging about 8.1 eggs per clutch. So, you know, that's, that's a real good number. It's a real good clutch ratio. I believe, because there's nothing else to it, that it's down to the food. The food is key. So yeah, they get to put on good weight and then they go on to give you a healthy clutch. Now, I predominantly feed my females uh, African soft food rats, which are between 50 and 60 grams, there or thereabouts. Anything too big than that, what I do find is it's too rich. They will eat it, but they may go off the next week. They may go off food the next week. Okay, so when they have an next breeder multi, you think, oh yeah, that's great. Look at this, 120 gram multi I'm gonna give my snake. That's fine, they probably will eat it, but they'll probably also go off food the next week because it's just too rich. So they'll keep that, store that, um, and especially during breeding season, you've gotta remember follicles and food don't fit in the same area. So when the follicles get so big, the food doesn't fit, so they will tend to stop feeding. Well, if you are giving them massive rats, they're gonna stop feeding before they really need to because they know that rodent won't fit. Even though the follicles are small, that rat is too big. So what they'll do, they'll stop feeding. They'll still go on maybe to give you a clutch of eggs, but what you'll notice is through the incubation period, the eggs will start to die. And that's because the mom didn't have the right nutrients or enough nutrients to go on and give the, the follicles or for them to go on to grow the follicles and then the embryo suffers as a result. So keeping the, 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 the food source small is key. And what I mean by that is, you know, the African soft food rats, a 50 gram multi is the equivalent, what I find, of a 100 to 150 gram rat. And what I mean by that is the protein levels and the fat content, they seem to absorb more from a multi than they do a rat. The minute they take a rat and eat it, they tend to crap most of it out. With an African soft food rat, very rare that happens. They will poo less, the poo won't be so smelly, and also, like I said, they will grow faster. So that tells me that that, that multi or that African soft food rat is packing more power within that little body. Trust me, I, I normally, on a non-breeding season, I normally feed my females 150 to 60 gram multi once every seven days. And then when it comes into breeding season and they are locking and they're growing them follicles, I tend to up it to probably once every five days. You know, if they want it. You know, if they don't want it, that's fine. I sort of, again, paying attention to your animals leads you into your feeding. Your feeding will lead you into your clutch development, okay, and your follicle developments. So all this is really important. And then what you will also have, once the female has given you the eggs, the bounce back period. Now, my females tend to bounce back within three days of laying a clutch of eggs. And um, what I find that is because A, I'm feeding them African soft food rats. Most of the females come on back on point normally on the same day I collect the eggs from them or the next day. But the longest I tend to have is probably about three days and they're back on point. Now what I will do, I will either, depending on how they're acting, I will always try them. If I take the eggs off them in the morning, I will try them on that night. If I take the eggs off them on the, on the evening or the afternoon, I will wait 24 hours before I offer them food. So there's two things I do. 
I always feed frozen thawed, but what I will do is after they've laid a clutch of eggs, I will always offer them a small meal, whether that be a small frozen thawed. If they're not quite sure about the frozen thawed for their first meal, I will offer them a live, and that's normally a medium, which is around about 30 to 40 gram African soft food wrap. Like I said, a smaller meal, they've just laid a clutch of eggs, you know, we, we don't really want to fill up the bellies too quick, too soon. We want to give them a nice digestive system and also a healthy digestive system. So don't go crazy, like I said, don't put a massive rat in there because it'll just, it'll put them off. Again, this is all stuff that I do. If, if you're, if everything you're, what you're doing is good and it's working, it's fine. Keep doing what you're doing. It's obviously working, okay? Um, but if you know it's not working and you, you need a little bit of tips, you know, th this is there to help. So I normally give them a smaller meal. Their first meal will be a smaller meal so it gets their digestive tract going and building. And then the next meal, again, I'll slowly build that up into the correct size that I normally feed them. Again, they'll go on to once every seven days. But what I will do, like I said, I will offer them a, thro a frozen thawed or a live. Now, I know they're frozen thawed feeders, but the live just tends to get their instinct going uh, and switches them back on. So. That's what I do, and it, and it seems to work. Now, it's very rare I have an animal which goes south. In other words, dies or has particular issues, especially after they've laid or during the breeding season. I probably get one snake a year which will pass away. Last year, I had a pastel yellow belly female. She gave me a clutch of eggs. She started eating, and then she just, she just went. There was no real reason behind it. There wasn't a health issue. She'd had, I think she had, I think she had one meal, uh, again, a small meal. She was a real good feeder before that, but it just happens. It happens in the wilds, predominantly more with males than it does females. But when, you're, when you get into breeding, guys, you need to understand that this will happen. A lot of breeders won't talk about it. A lot of breeders won't discuss it because it's something that is not a, a topic that they want to admit, you know, losing an animal. None of us want to lose an animal. But this happens, this is part of nature in the wild. The males would breed a female and predominantly that's it, that's our job done, okay? They wouldn't do anything else. Uh, they would obviously go off and most of the times that they find snakes in Africa that are, are bull pythons that have died if they haven't been eaten by predators by then is normally due to, and it's normally a male and it's normally around about the breeding season because the males will go and find a female and they will go nuts to find a female. So their feeding response goes off and they go and find a female. Once they've found a female, they've done their business in the wild, they will pro probably more than likely then not have the energy to go and find a rodent or to try and seek out rodent dens to feed, hence why they pass away. So animals during breeding season can pass away. It can happen with any animal. It's an animal at the end of the day, you could open a tub and it's just gone, whether that be a hatchling or a breeding animal, but it tends to happen more with breeding animals, okay? It's facts. So what I've found over the years, and the first time I found uh, one of my breeding males that had died, I was devastated. Uh, I contacted Ralph Davis, I said, Ralph, what's happened? Is, is this what it is? And he said, yeah, it happens, Gav, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the things. And in actual fact, Ralph disclosed to me that I was lucky to just have that one male go. Obviously, the more snakes you have, the more chances are you're gonna have issues or come across issues, but a lot of breeders have more than, than, than that die. And it's just one of them things, guys, okay? It's, it's best that you know, it's just one of those things. What I do find, though, is since I would say it's been five years, possibly five years now, predominantly, I have only exclusively fed African soft furred rats, and I have absolutely very minor issues. Like I said, last year I had one female that died. That wasn't down to food, that was just a real bizarre thing. Uh, I spoke to my vet, asked him about an autopsy. They, he basically said, look, it's one of them things, I don't think you'll find anything. She looked healthy, she was acting normal, it happens. But what I do find is a lot of breeders who are feeding rats or mice, do have a lot of bounce back issues. And when I talk about bounce back issues, it's because the snakes aren't getting the right minerals and vitamins and calcium and fat and protein content in their original diet. Now, 
This all comes back down to the food that we feed them. So if the rat or the mouse hasn't got the correct content, then after a snake has given eggs or has laid eggs, then potentially there could be issues. There could be issues at the end. And again, every breeder has their own ways of dealing with things and, and, and whether or not they disclose the information or not, it's up to them. But facts, talking from someone who's on the inside, they do have issues, everyone has issues. But I believe a lot of that can be counteracted by the food. And again, this is why food is key and food is important. I believe feeding African soft-furred rats is a massive part of this hobby. And it's something, again, got overlooked in the past because it, well, if it's feeding African soft-furred rats, then it's a problem feeder, da 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 It's not, it's their original food, it's their original diet from the wild. So I think it's key, okay, it is key. I'm not saying everyone that's feeding rats is doing it wrong, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, you know, to try and avoid issues instead of giving them supplements, if we give them a healthy diet, I don't have any issues. I don't need to get any supplements in to supplement my snakes because They've got a healthy diet. The quality of the rodents is second to none, so I know what's going in the rodents, and I know what's going into my snakes. Ultimately, like I said, it's all about the right food source. So you need to make sure you've got these things in place for a healthy breeding season moving forward. With that being said, like, you know, I know this is a lot of talking. It's stuff that I need you guys to try and understand, and I, and I wanna educate and help you. It's not, do this my way, this is the right way, da da da. It's my data I'm sharing with you guys and I just want you all to succeed and take from this what you will. Food is key, food will make a massive difference. I also find most of my breeding males stay on food during the breeding season as well due to them being fed African soft furred rats. Now, some people have spoke about feeding gerbils. I have never fed gerbils. I think I tried one snake probably eight years ago, something like that. It was no good, it wasn't the issue. So the little bit of research that I've done on gerbils is that it's okay, but it's not It's not the best thing, okay? It's the simplest thing is African soft furred rats. That's gonna be your go-to uh, food source. That's what's giving me the results. That's what's helping me do and be successful. You wanna feed rats, that's entirely up to you. So yeah, going forward, rodents, uh, the food source is key. Because remember, that's what makes your follicles. That's what makes that's what makes your follicles and makes them healthy. So I'm not sure exactly where I was because Dan, the editor, called me uh, to discuss shooting schedules, etc., etc. But anyway, so let's get back into the video. So the females, knowing your females, looking at the condition of them, looking how they're acting is key. I mentioned that females being in water bowls, a lot of people think the worst and think that it's got mites, and it can. But what people fail to realize is, actually this species of snake, well, most species uh, with scales, they can take water actually through the scales and through the skin. And the reason for this is because they can absorb moisture through the body. So sometimes what you'll find is when a female is soaking in a water bowl. She's just trying to take on moisture and take on water and, and sort of help with her rehydration. It doesn't mean she's dehydrated. It just means she needs more water than what she can actually take in. And again, in the wild, in Africa, you know, they wouldn't be looking for a lake or anywhere like that. They'd be underground um, where it is moist and they would try and absorb as much fluid through their skin or through their scales as possible to help them rehydrate. So if you see a female in a water bowl, it doesn't mean she's got mites, it just means that, that she's just trying to rehydrate. And that's a real common thing as well. I get sent lots of pictures and, or questions saying, Gav, my snake keeps going in the water bowl, da 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 da. One thing I'll say, just check your humidity in that particular tub. And again, in your tubs, the humidity is gonna be higher than your room. Again, it's pointless having your room highly humidity, highly, highly humidified. High, high humidity uh, in your room because if the humidity can't get into the tubs, it's kind of a wasted effort, you know? So what I tend to do, I'll make sure that the tubs are humid or as humid as they need to be. And then obviously that will escape and come into the room, hence raising the room humidity. Uh, again, the fans will circulate. Again, having fans, again, good air circulation. So that's key. We're gonna look at some females. Some of the females are in the glow stage. Some are just coming down off an ovulation, some are in a pre-lay shed, 
some are smashing food and I'm just going to show you there's three females behind me which are Genex double head clam pieds. They're sisters, they were hatched the same time, they feed exactly the same time and most of the time they shed the same time. These two, these three females I'm going to show you, one is actually going through a glow before they go, the other two are smashing food and off. their follicle development is very much very similar. Uh, the one female is currently in front and the one female I think has just shed out as well so you'll get to see the, the colour and what we talk about when we talk about the glow before they go. And again, most of the times once they glow it's because they're getting flushed with hormones and that, that hormone is coming through, hence making them look hypo in colour. Okay, so the glow before they go is as it is. Pretty much when they glow, it's a very high probability that they're, that they're gonna go. So it's a good sign. So we're gonna look at some females, we're gonna look at what they're doing, how they're acting, uh, where they are. Predominantly the females you're gonna see are more in the cool end than the warm end. And again, you'll see various nesting traits, all that sort of stuff. Let's have a look at a few females and let's get into it. Again, if there's any questions, please put them down in the comment box below. I'd love to read all your comments. So let's check out some females. So this female I produced, she's homegrown. She's a spot nose, 100% heck clown. And she belongs to my very good friend, Alan over at No Limit Morphs. I've had this female back. Um, we're doing a breeding project together. I currently have her sister as well, which is a pastel spot nose heck clown. Uh, she's also breeding for me, but this female's uh, been exclusively bred to a leopard clown. Again, we're just going playing it safe with the odds. We're looking for some Batmans. I've probably got about three or four clutches for Batmans this season. And uh, yeah, I need a Batman in my collection for my next part of the project that I'm doing, uh, which obviously I'll explain to you as we go. But this girl's in a prelay shed. She will be the third clutch for this season and uh, yeah so she's on her way the next day she should shed out and 30 days from there we should have a nice pile of eggs fingers crossed so this female here is just a beautiful looking pied and this beautiful looking pied is just coming down off an ovulation hopefully you guys can sort of see that there okay she's just coming down off an ovulation she's been uh, exclusively bred she, this is a first time female. She's been exclusively bred to my Sunset Het Ultramel Pos Het Albino. As you can see, we've got, we, we've got some double hets inbound, possible triple hets, possible quad hets, but um, definitely 100% Sunset, 100% Het uh, Pied. And what I'm really interested in, uh, this female was really orange as a baby. And as you can see, she's still nice and bright. She's beautiful. So I'm really interested in seeing what the sunset and the pie do with each other, especially this female. And, and it's all about picking your genes, guys. Guys, you know, quality animals, start with your basics. A quality pied like this, a quality sunset that I've got, you know, um, we can only produce beautiful babies. So really looking forward to this pairing. So she's just coming down off an ovulation. This female here is an orange dream, enchi, ivory female, and she's been bred to the sunset, exclusively to the sunset. She's a, a virgin as well. So this girl, as you can see, is bowl hugging, and she is also off food. Now, what I like about this sign, when they're not smashing food, uh, i.e. when they've gone from smashing food to virtually stopping, and you know they've got a good feeding response, this indicates to me that basically only either follicles or food can fit in the same area. So I've offered her small meals, she still didn't take them, so I know without ultrasounding her, she's certainly on her way. So again, we're, we're gonna make some, some yellow bellies, we're gonna have Orange Dream in the mix, and we're gonna have Enchi in the mix as well. So, and everything's gonna be 100% Het Sunset, Posset Ultramel, and that's just one badass project that I'm really looking forward to. So this girl, again, can't wait, uh, really excited about this girl, and another girl that's on point, normally we're feeding, and she's off. So, a fantastic sign regarding breeding. Another female that's off food, and as you can see, 
she's doing really well she's sort of nesting and warming herself up this girl I got from Aussie this girl is a pinstripe exantic pos het pied so what I've done with this female uh, again first time mom I want to try and prove out the het pied before we go any further I see a few signs with her that she's 100% het pied but I have been breeding the pastel gene x pied to her so if she doesn't prove out to be 100% um, het pied we're going to get some pastel pinstripe gene x double het exantic pied and I love pin in pied I love pin exantics I think gene x will make an amazing contribution to the exantic project but I also love lemon blast pieds now you take lemon blast and add gene x and then add exantic on top wow what an absolutely awesome project so if she doesn't prove out that's fine i'm just looking forward to producing those hets those double hets but again just seeing if she's going to be um a, you know het for pied to me is important proving that side out um, instead of working with a lot of you know possets and ifs and maybes i'd rather try and prove her out first and then go from there so this female is a pinstripe exantic posset pied from the man himself aussie and she has been bred exclusively to the pastel gene x pied so let's see what we get from this clutch awesome so here we have three gene x females which are all sisters and all three of these are double het clown pied and all three of them were smashing food and i say were because this female here has currently stopped and as you can see there's a massive color difference between her and her sisters and the reason for that is because she's in that stage what we call the glow before they go okay so as you can see she she almost looks a completely different color to her sisters almost hypo like and this girl's currently stopped smashing food so i know uh, without using my ultrasound i know that this female is currently on track and which is good absolutely good and then this female over here hopefully you guys can see she's currently quite chunky around the lower third of her body which is good also got a great feeding response and this female as well she has just shed out as you can see as well nice and chunky down the back end there so but you can see that this female is completely different color to this female and this female is is darker as well compared to this female like i said this one's going in the uh, glow before they go stage and I just wanted to share that with you so you could see the difference and you certainly will spot that glow stage especially when you've got sisters and all three of them are you know on point with their coloration um, so yeah so you can tell that this female is going to go so that's awesome so this female here she's the original black phantom mom um, and as you can see she is on her way so again an awesome feeding response from this female absolutely smashes the food and she's kind of going through a build stage at the moment uh, like i said she's currently off food i'm keeping an eye on her on how she's developing um, but she's currently off food but just look how dark she is just absolutely stunning and the blushing uh, she has been bred as well to my acid male which is a pastel ivory acid and again we're going to make some awesome combos with this female as you can see she's on point she's like what are you doing dad but yeah absolutely buzzing can't wait to see what we can produce from her this season uh including the acid in this project as well so looking forward to some black phantom acid combos fingers crossed a eh? good girl so this female she is a pin ultramel possible enchi 
she's been bred to a pastel ultramouth male so obviously we're going to produce some lemon blast ultramouths uh, and prove out one way or another if she is enchi um, but at the moment she's in shed so she's pretty much done so looking forward to seeing what this girl does first time mom i'm not expecting a big clutch from this female but um still looking forward to seeing what 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 she produces so here we have a pastel clown and this girl was bred to my um pastel ivory acid male and she's glowing so she has stopped smashing food as well because she was smashing food she's currently stopped and now we're sort of getting into that stage where she's looking good she's looking nice and plump and again we're looking for some acid combos obviously they'll be yellow belly because the dad's an ivory but we're all they're all going to be 100 percent heck clown so looking forward to this acid uh, project in the clown Again, another girl that's gone off food, and as you can see, she's looking quite plump. Um, this girl, again, she uh, had a fantastic feeding response. She's a pastel enchi leopard, and she's been bred to a desert ghost. Um, looking forward to producing some combos that are 100% het desert ghost. Um, I'm also breeding a firefly leopard female. Uh, to the desert ghost and also a pied or a leopard pied should I say to the desert ghost because I really do love the leopard desert ghosts so yeah really buzzing all girls are on point absolutely smashing it so this girl has just shed out and just look at her this girl is as you can see beautiful normal girl but she's not just any normal girl this girl is a hundred percent double het ultramile clown and she again smashing food and she is off her food um but just look look at that just beautiful blushing along the back it almost looks like the patterns 3d almost like it's standing up but i absolutely love hets and double hets because they certainly make a difference to just a normal ball python or a normal looking ball python just stunning and again off food looking nice and chunky around the back here awesome fingers crossed for some ultra male clowns this season so there you have it guys i hope this video i know it's been a long one but i hope it's give you a lot of food for thought a lot of information and a lot of things to look for in your females in this breeding season again remember it's all a learning process we always learn something new every year we do this process and for me i'm all about just learning collecting data again like i said once you know your animals you don't need an ultrasound machine for me that's just me collecting data so i can see things and just get the hard evidence down on paper um, knowing your animals is key food is key as well like i said food is is i believe one of the main ingredients that we a lot of people tend to miss they're more concentrating on putting the male in with the female instead of looking at the food content that they're feeding their animal okay so just bear that in mind um, but for now guys i hope you're all well thanks again for all your support if you wouldn't mind hitting that notification bell smashing that like button and also giving me a subscribe that really will help me and just it just makes the world so i know it's been a long one but thanks for sitting around thanks for joining in thanks for coming on board thanks for all your support everything <laughs> everything guys i love and respect you all take care and i'll see you guys in the next one I hit record a drop, you can't ignore it. I'm transforming.